we can represent waves like this. Maybe the wave looks like that in reality, maybe it doesn't. There's my equilibrium line. And one complete wave is from here. One complete wave is from this point here to this point here. This is one complete wave or one complete cycle. Of course, that's wavelength there. The time it takes for this wave to be completed is called the time period. We give that the letter capital T, not little t, capital T. And that's obviously measured in seconds. You can actually find the time period by just taking the reciprocal of the frequency. In other words, one divided by the frequency. That goes the other way around as well. Frequency is equal to one divided by the time period. But we can also represent a complete wave, not with this, but with a circle. It starts at the top, goes all the way around to here. Now here we talk about time periods with a wave. Here we can talk about time periods here as well, but we are talking about a circle. So we can say that a full circle is two pi radians. So that goes the same for our waves. A full wave we can say is two pi radians. What about instead if we have a wave that only goes halfway? So here's my full wave like that. That's a full circle. What about if I have a wave that only does half a wave? Well, that's the same as us going just halfway round a full, a full circle. So half circle, how many radians? Just pi this time, pi rads. What about a quarter? Just stops there. That's the same as a quarter of a circle. Gives us pi over two radians. You could go to an eighth of a circle as well, which would give you pi over four radians. Now what if I said that I had two bits on a wave? So let's look at these two bits here. This point here and this point here. These bits on the wave are not in phase with each other. In other words, they're not on the same part of the wave. This point and this point here are because they're both on the peak. So we can say that they are completely in phase. These two points here, one is on a peak, one is on a trough. So if you have our wave like so, and we're looking at this point here and this point here, these are pi radians out of phase. One of these particles is half a wave, half a complete wave, or pi radians out of phase with the other one. It could be in front, it could be behind. We don't know, depending on which way this is going. What about here? This point and this point. We're only a quarter of a wave out of phase here. I'm gonna put this here as well, half a wave. We could also say 180 degrees. This here though, we're a quarter of a wave out of phase, that's pi over two rads out of phase. And obviously that's gonna be 90 degrees out of phase. So we can talk about bits of a wave being completely in phase, if they're on the same point, just a full wavelength apart, or we can talk about them being half a wave out of phase, pi radians, 180 degrees, or quarter of a wave, pi over two radians, or 90 degrees out of phase. There's a quick way of finding out phase difference. In other words, how far out of phase things are. We just take two pi, and we times it by what the time difference is between two bits and divide by the time period, or we take our two pi again, and we do our distance between the two particles divided by the entire wavelength. All we're doing is taking our full circle of two pi radians and times it by the fraction of how far through our full circle or our full wave we actually are by doing a little time divided by the total time or a little distance divided by 
the total wavelength. So we dealt with one wave. What about if there are two waves? Specifically, let's talk about a piece of string. There's my piece of string, or where it would be if it wasn't plucked. Let's talk about a guitar string, I guess. What I'm gonna do is pluck the string. What that does is send a wave down the string like that. What happens when it reaches the other end? Well, it actually comes back. It gets reflected. You've probably seen that with a slinky or with a piece of string or rope or something like that. Now, when these two waves meet, there's only room for one wave on the piece of string. So are we going to see this wave on the string going down like that? Are we going to see this wave on the string going to the left like that? Actually, we're not going to see either because these two waves are going to superimpose. When waves meet, they interfere and superimpose. What we would see isn't actually two separate waves, but just one complete wave. What's gonna happen is that the peaks and the troughs are gonna add up from both of these waves. In reality, what we're going to see is this wave here. I haven't drawn that very well, but you get the idea. Notice that the amplitude is bigger. Now what I've done is I've drawn one wave here and then I've drawn the reflection the other side. Because what's weird is that when you have two waves that are identical, and that means the same frequency and wavelength, you get a standing wave or a stationary wave. In other words, this wave is not actually moving down the string. These two waves are going in opposite directions, but when they meet, if they're identical, and the conditions are right as well, then we get this standing wave being formed. All that happens is we get our bits of our wave just going up and down. This here is what we call an anti-node. That's where we have our wave at max amplitude. Notice I didn't say max displacement, I said max amplitude. All of these bits on the wave are vibrating at amplitudes. In other words, this bit is gonna be vibrating down to here and back. This bit is gonna be vibrating down to here and back and so on and so forth. This here is what we call a node. We have a zero amplitude. So we no longer see a moving wave. We don't see a, a wave that's moving to the right or the left. We just see this wave, these peaks going up and down, up and down, up and down, like so. Now at a node, the medium, the string, the particles, whatever, they don't move at all. That means there's no oscillations. Why is that? That's because the two waves traveling in the opposite directions at those points always add up to zero. That means that you have a peak in a trough or zero displacement and zero displacement. Whatever it is, they always cancel each other out, so you get no amplitude at those points. That's what we call destructive interference. They always cancel each other out, so we end up with no displacement at all. At an antinode, it changes between destructive interference, because the string does cross the equilibrium at a point, but also we get constructive interference as well, where a peak meets a peak and adds up to a super peak, as it were, and we have a trough and a trough meeting and adding up to a super trough. Let's say that I have a piece of string, a guitar string of length L. What's the simplest standing wave that can be formed on this? It's this wave here. We have nodes at either end and we have an anti-node right here as well. So it's just one loop as it were. So this loop goes up, down, up, down like that. There are two waves traveling along the string in opposite directions, but we don't see them. We just see the superimposed version, the standing wave. Now, how many waves do we have from this to this end? 
we're not going up, down, and back again. We're only just going up and down. So we actually only have half a wave. This is the first standing wave that can be produced on a string, and we call it the fundamental mode. It's also called the first harmonic. And seeing that we only have half a wavelength going from here to here, because we don't have a full wave, we only have a full wave going there and back, we can say that the length of the string is equals to lambda over two. What's the next wave that can be made on this? Still got length L, but what about if we increase the frequency? Still got two fixed ends, so we have to have nodes on the end. But now we have a node in the middle and two antinodes. We have two loops. This is called the second harmonic. You might also hear that called the first overtone. Now, it's called the overtone because when you do pluck a guitar string or hit the key on a piano which strikes the string, you're making this fundamental and that's what you hear most. But in fact, you're actually making this harmonic as well. And you can hear that just more faintly. And in fact, you're actually making the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth harmonics as well, just very, very quietly. So it's the fundamental that's the loudest. In fact, anybody who plays guitar, if you know how to play harmonics just by gently putting your finger on a string uh, in the middle of the string, you are actually forcing a note. So you're actually stopping the fundamental mode being created. So it's only the second harmonic that can be created. That's why it sounds a lot more high pitched because the frequency is higher and the wavelength is shorter. Okay, let's do one more then. This is my length L there. Now we're gonna go for three loops as it were. So we have one, two, three, four nodes and three antinodes, three loops. So don't forget that we have destructive interference happening at the nodes. That means that the string is never displaced from equilibrium. And at the antinodes we have constructive interference at this point and this point but at some point it is gonna go through the equilibrium. So we have both constructive and destructive interference happening at an antinode. In this case, we have one and a half waves on the length of string. So we're gonna say L is three halves lambda. And yeah, this is the third harmonic, also known as the second overtone. So you might have noticed that we had to begin with for the fundamental L is a half lambda, then one lambda, so two halves lambda. We can generalize this for a piece of string that has two fixed ends. The length of the string is gonna be equals to n lambda over two. n can be any number, any integer, any whole number. So that's okay if we've got a piece of string, but what about if we have a wind instrument? Here we have a tube, that's our instrument, and we're blowing into this tube and we set up a standing wave with sound wave inside. Now when you have a closed end, you always have a node produced at that point. If you have an open end, you're always gonna have an anti-node at that point. So what's the simplest standing wave that we can form in this? Well, it's not gonna be what we saw on the string like that, because we have this open end here, we have to have an anti-node, it's actually this. How many ways have we got going from here to here now? If this is our L, we've only got a quarter of a wave. So we're gonna say that L is one quarter of lambda. What's the next one that we can make? As usual, this is the fundamental. Or the first harmonic. What's the next one that we can make? It's gonna be this here. Again, we've got a node this end, anti-node at this end, but we've got a node in the middle there as well. This time, we actually have three quarters of a wave. And that's gonna be our second 
harmonic or our first overtone. Start off with a quarter lambda and we're adding a half lambda with every one. What about if we have an open end? At each end, you're gonna have an anti-node at each end. So the simplest way, the fundamental that we're gonna form is this. And this is n equals lambda over two or half lambda again. That's our, whole, that's our fundamental, or our first harmonic. The next one that we can make is gonna be this here. And there we have a whole lambda. So that actually follows the same pattern as what we saw on the string, but it's the only difference is that we have an anti-node at each end instead of a node. One last thing. So if we go back to our string, we can calculate the fundamental mode. Frequency equals one over two times the length of the string times the square root of the tension in the string divided by mu. Now mu in this case is mass per unit length. So that's gonna have the units, kilograms per meter. So you can measure that just by taking one meter of your string and putting it on a balance and seeing what the mass is. That will give you mass per unit length. And if your string is hanging over a pulley, then this tension is gonna be equal to the weight that is hanging on the end of that string. Just one note about proportionality. F here is proportional to root T. If you times the tension by four, if you times the force by four, that means the frequency will double. If you think I've missed something out or if you have any questions or suggestions, then please leave a comment down below. And I'll see you next time.